welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I will be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For more information, you can go to the website svos.org. Our guest, Wayne Wickern, is the creator of beautiful and unique ladies' hats. His tasteful yet sometimes startling designs can be seen at the DeYoung Museum Textile Collection and at his studio at the Peninsula Museum of Art. So welcome, Wayne. Thank you, Sally. I'm delighted to be here. Great. So how did you get involved in creating hats? What led you one day to decide, hats, that's what I want to do for a living? Well. I'll give you the short story. Okay. I grew up on a farm in Wyoming and moved to Seattle after graduation to work in the floral design business. Aha. Uh -huh. And I did in that I did work in that business for a number of years, but became interested in ballet dance. The chorus line came through town, mm -hmm. the turning point movie, and believe it or not, Saturday Night Fever. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> well, I pursued it. And I studied dance there, and then eventually I moved to New York City. Aha. Uh -huh. And I was there for six years, pursuing study and also work. And occasionally I worked in a regional company. And at one point I realized that the glamour of dance is for the audience. Right. So that put me <laughs> on a different track. I worked part-time in the costume shop occasionally when I was on regional companies because there was not a lot of life outside of the company. And so eventually that led me to hat making. Aha. Uh -huh. So very interesting. So you went through a, a whole creative process. You started visually, then the physical costuming of ballet, and then to the beautiful hats that you create. <laughs> so let's take a look at some of the um, images that you brought of some of the hats and the different styles that you have. All right. This is a spice colored, or at least I call it a spice colored um, cloche, and I've trimmed this with um, leaves from the remainder of the felt scrap after the hat has been blocked and made. That's beautiful. So do you cut out the leaves yourself? Yes, the, um, I have a template of real leaf shapes that I've collected over time, and some of them are maybe not actual leaf shapes, but modified. But they're using the remaining pieces of the felt and straw that I work with so that uh, the detail is cohesive with the hat. Right. Oh, that's a beautiful hat. This is a straw hat, and it's trimmed a rather ma uh, much more flamboyantly with uh, silk sash and a silk leaf and veiling. Wow, that's really detailed, and that's made out of straw. That's a paracisal straw. Interesting. This is also a paracisal straw wow. and a lot more free form. The uh, wired edge has too much wire in it, and so it forces the hat into a swirl pattern, and then I've captured it in a few places to pull it off the face there. So how did you capture it like that? Is that stiff, and that's the shape that it's always in? Um, it's it's a f like a fabric, so if you pull up those wrinkles and tack them into place, that'll stay in place. So they're sewn into right, place. Right, they're sewn and tacked into place. Wow, and so that was a, could be a wide-brimmed hat. Yes. And this is the... that my take on that famous shape that Da Vinci made for Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's, that big domed shape. This one's a honeycomb pattern weave straw, and then it has a silk sash and a rather large flower. So does that, <laughs> it is, does that straw come in that pattern? Is that how it? The straw is woven in that pattern. Interesting. I purchased the straw base and use it from there. And then the design, the trim, do you create that? Yes. I, it, depending upon the event for the person who's interested in the hat or if I'm making a stock hat, it's, it's entirely up to me if it's a stock hat. Um, that's a, you can't tell so much from the picture, but it's a silver gray sash and bow loops in the back. They're not so visible. And then 
a sort of silver gray and black flower. That's really cool. I like that. And this is a felt hat again, and I've used the remainder of the felt scrap to make these feathers. They're wired down the middle, and I've stitched the wire by machine, actually, right down the middle so I have control of the shape. And then I have that, you know, little brooch there wow, as so a detail. Do you go in search of brooches like that, I or do. do you ever commission beadwork like that? I have commissioned beadwork in the past, um, but this is actually a, a commercial brooch that I've used here. Oh, that's beautiful. And how do you say the name of that hat? A feather toque. A toque. Interesting. It's sort of a bicorn, if you will, uh, across the head. Bicorns could be worn front to back as well, but this has a, this shape is a very common shape through history. So you base your designs on historical designs? Uh, yes, modified them a bit, yes. Well, interesting. So where do you do these the work on this beautiful hats. You must have like a huge studio I have, with machines. I do have a large studio and I, my studio is at the Peninsula Museum of Art, Museum Studios, and there are 30 studios in the building. Oh. A variety of artists, sculptors, uh, wood carvers, stone carvers, photographers, a huge number of, of skilled people working there. So where on the peninsula is it? It's in Burlingame, Burlingame. on the corner of Truesdale and El Camino. So right near 101 in right. Burlingame. Interesting. Right by the police station. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where your studio is? That's where my studio is. And in my studio I have racks and racks of blocks. Blocks are what a milliner uses, at least my specialty is blocked felt and or straw hats. Right. And it's a wood form that is either vintage or a contemporary form that I use to shape the felt and straw blanks over well, to achieve these shapes. That's excellent. You brought some pictures of your stu you in your studio and some of the tools that you use. Why don't we take a look at those now? Okay. So this would be me. Um, blocking a felt hat, which I'm going to do today as well. The felt is hot and, and steamed, and then it's pulled over the form, um, physically held in place with cords and stretched tight. And here I'm um, sculpting, if you will, or stretching the felt further down on it. Then there's a compress piece that for any particular shape that has a recess, it forces the felt in the opposite direction, sort of a negative-positive situation. This is the finished hat, still on the block, of course. And this is a variety of blocks just on the, on the table here, a number of shapes, some of which I have here today that we can review later. But the, the wood shapes are infinite in variety and um, very unique skilled artisan craft tools that I just, you know, use as a tool. Well, you have a demonstration prepared for us of blocking a hat. So this is the hat that I'm going to block today, which of course was in the photos earlier, but it's a teardropped recessed crown little skimmer. And this is the form for it here. It comes in a couple pieces. I could use different crowns with this block. I could use this crown here, and it's more of a, a masculine fedora shape. This one is a, a little more feminine, actually. So it's pegged. Whoop, here we go. So you can mix and match the different types. I can. Types. So that's and good. And because the blocks were made in very different times, some of them belong together, some of them do not. This one here is a composite. I mean, I could make this hat, but I could use any of the crowns around here as well. So I do pull a piece of plastic over this. So this is the compressed piece, and once the felt has been blocked, this will push the shape uh -huh. in. Yeah. So this just protects the block from the moisture, and it protects the felt as well. So this is a uh, velour fur felt that I'm using here today. Oh, so it and comes in that shape. It's not comes flat. in this shape. It's not flat. Oh, the, interesting. There, of course, there is felt that is flat, but it would not achieve the three-dimensional requirement of the block.
before it tore or was too bulky. Oh. So this is how it's prepared commercially. And most of the felt that I use comes from the uh, Czech Republic. And so I add a little moisture here to help it hold heat while I'm working on it. It also helps the felt have good memory for its new position in the world. <laughs> and then with my power steamer here, I heat first the crown. That's what I'll work on first. So, so that's like a steam iron. A lot of steam. Yes. I'm used to it. <laughs> my students have to use gloves. <laughs> And so then I mold this onto the crown and I pull a string around to hold it in place while I work out the brim. Uh -huh. It's quite physical actually. This is a pretty simple hat, but some of these shapes are a lot more demanding. Okay, then I have to work out the sections of the brim here. So is we, there a certain amount of steam that you need that can we you need tell enough by the to touch? allow it to stretch oh. and um, and hot and stretch so that it so that it actually creates sort of a tension on the felt that it will remember when it's finished. Interesting. Now if I was using a straw piece, I do not have to do that. I can just use water. Oh. I can use steam, but it doesn't really matter. But a straw hat is done in a similar fashion? A similar fashion. So I'm using these tacks here to hold this in place temporarily till I can get the, the closing string on. I never imagined this in hat making. This is great. <laughs> it is a obscure field and a low tech, except for the power iron here. What did people use in the past before power irons were invented? Well, they probably had a boiler system. Um, it could be done wet as well. That's a little messy. And this um, felt itself has a, has a sort of a velvet finish, so the water would be hard on it. It would be hard to get the loft of the felt back. There's many kinds of felt, of course, so it's relative to the product that you're using. In the of course, the thing with felt is that in a factory or even in my studio that most of the time you're working on felt in the summer with the heat, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's cross season of course, which is kind of And then this would be the the brim string here. So then when you're done with that and it's set, you then trim the edges off? Right. So this skirt here, at least in this instance, for my purposes, will be cut away. And that's what I use to make the leaves, the feathers ah. that you see in, in my work. So How long the, does it take for it to set? Um, I usually leave it on overnight. Oh, so it's um, quick. In a factory situation, they have a a positive and a negative of the shape and it's on a big uh, press unit and it's plumbed for heat and it's plumbed for steam hmm. and so they can work very quickly they don't use any water so they steam it block it the press comes down they take it off they move on to the next one um, I don't have that kind of system and I don't need that much speed <laughs> I'm not making that many of the same hat So I would heat this portion up here because I need to cause that recess. So right. I need a little heat up here. And 
and then um, in my studio, of course, I would compress this, and I have some weights that I would pull on this and let it sit overnight. Well, excellent. And then yeah. how do you get it off at the end? Ah, so I have one here. This is not the same shape, of course, but the strings come loose, and it's not that fragile. You just sort of separate it from the block. So it, it maintains its shape it as you take it off. It will maintain its shape. Oh, look at that. Now, I would cut this remainder off, and then I hem it or edge it with ribbon, or it could be a raw edge, it could be a braid edge, whatever the designer or the interested party chooses. And then we would have a, some sort of trim here to cover this string line and a hat. There you go. Well, you have some more images of hats that we can take a look at. Let's look at some new designs. Okay. So this is, again, that feather toque. This is a printed felt, and it has a different finish than the one I was using at the table there. It looks this more a, furry. It is much more furry, but it is a printed felt, and it, I, I guess this would be ocelot or leopard. And then again, I've used the felt feathers that streak up across the top there. I love those flowing designs. Ooh, and this is um, a cocteau topper. Um, a little bit piquant there. It sits forward on the head. It doesn't sit down on the head. It's actually quite small in the head size. It doesn't look so much there. But it perches on the front of the head. A lot of hats in the 40s perched forward on the head. And this is a style like so that. So where would someone wear something like that? Hmm. Well, you know, in this area, there is a lot of people who dress in period clothing. Interesting. And so this is um, definitely, you know, a period piece. So um, there's a lot of the dance community. I mean, the waltz community, the, the deco society, all those different. I'm sure you've heard of the uh, Dickens Fair. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And this is more of a cocktail shape. It, the, the flower and the leaves are sort of forming a little peekaboo veil situation, if you will. Um, very dramatic piece. Yeah. Is there felt underneath that? There's a little felt cap that sits on the head, and then the rest is just um, arranged on there to look as though it just blossomed right on there. So do people commission hats like this for, from you? They do. Okay. Um, one of the pictures coming up would be a commission, but we'll grab that when we can. Okay. This is a Paris topper. It's a parasisal straw. It's got an asymmetrical brim, um, sort of that Mad Hatter look with a little twist. And again, a silk sash, a beautiful multicolored rose there, and some veiling. You must have a tremendous trim collection. Oh, uh, racks. <laughs> <laughs> But you can That's never a, have too much trim. It's beautiful. <laughs> Very nice. And this is an interesting felt. This is probably where my leaves and blades were, were formed. The, the mottling on this felt reminds me of the stains that leaves leave on the sidewalk oh, in the yeah. fall. It does. And so when people ask me, where do I get my ideas? That's one of them. Uh -huh. You see that, and then an artist interprets that in another way. So. The leaves on the side of that hat sort of pick up that feeling of those fading shapes in the fall. I like that one. Ooh, this, this is, is a different. commission. <laughs> wow. This is a client in San Francisco, and she has a, a large interest in the designer Erte, who did a lot of work for Vogue magazine and was a designer of clothing in the 20s. And so it's, you know, it's extremely laden with uh, beadwork. It's an, all, it's an emerald green, dark emerald green, and that the beads are iridescent. And so you created the beadwork on there? I did not create the beadwork per se. Those are different motif and pieces that I have sort of collaged, I guess you could say, okay. together, and, um, and made the entire composition from existing work. The fringe comes right. separately. You're not a beater, but you I'm not take a beater. it and design right. the beads into your right. hat designs. Well, that's beautiful. And this is a little cloche uh, reminiscent of uh, Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, if you've watched that program. And uh, the, 
the little discs on the side are made from straw braid, which we haven't talked about yet. And then those feathers on the side there are burnt ostrich plume. And by burnt, I mean they've been chemically damaged, if oh. you will, to strip away the finer flues. Mm -hmm. So they're not so fluffy. They're a little more skeletal. That's interesting. Look at that. And this is a, you know, a leopard print. It's sort of ombres from the gold to the more tobacco color. And the crown is a slant fedora. And then it has that single felt feather streaking up off the side oh, I there. see the indent that you were showing us before. Mm -hmm. Interesting. This is another type of straw hat that um, we'll be talking about in a minute. It's Paglina straw braid. So that is braid that comes in a skein like yarn. Oh. And it is sewn by a, a, a specific little machine, a straw braid machine. And it's an antique for sure. Um, in a spiral to grow the shape, if you will. Oh, so you sew that I together. I do sew that. Oh, wow. So you created that whole shape right. from the braid. And then the trim is a silk sash and the magnolia blossoms there on the side um, to finish it. Oh, it's beautiful. So that straw braid is what I use to make this hat. The, um, excuse me. This is the straw braid. As you can see, it comes in, this, in a hank. Uh -huh. This is like 144 yards, more than enough to make this hat. I can probably make three, four hats out of this. OK. And this hat has this interesting feature on the side, which is actually accidental. Um, <laughs> in learning to make this kind of hat, the, the challenge is, is managing the straw. This is overlapped half the width of the straw. Wow. So you yeah, know, this is really that. kind of challenging. Because Plus you have the, to have a like direction you're going in. <laughs> the growth or shrinkage of the hat depends upon the tension that the operator of the machine is managing with the two oh. hands. So to learn to use this machine when I first got it and had it repaired at you know considerable cost, I couldn't get it to work. And finally I just thought, oh don't worry about it. Just sew the straw braid. Right. See well I got this long sleeve. <laughs> And then eventually I was able to pull the straw out and get the shape. Well, then I decided just, just use that. So I coiled it up and it now, I make this hat repeatedly with oh, this design, which originally, you know, so was. So do you put it on a block like the felt or is it? Afterwards I after touch it up on the block, but I'm going back and forth, mm -hmm. checking the size, checking the width and keeping the shape under control because it's, at the machine it's a little, uh, random. Yes. <laughs> well, interesting. <laughs> and this is the other straw braid, the, that beautiful magenta color. It's a much, much finer straw, as oh, you can yeah. see. It's not even a quarter inch and wide. And you sew that as well. <laughs> oh, that's detailed. Quite tedious. I use this a lot for trim, though. So on that little black hat with the discs, right. mm -hmm. that is just flat discs that I've made out of out this. Out of that. So you spend so, a lot of time at the sewing mm -hmm. machine. And, uh, you know, making things by hand. These are some of the straws. These are parasitical straws. They primarily, I think, oh, these come from China, but straws come from all over the world. Ecuador, uh, oddly enough, Ecuador produces Panama straw. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But it became known as Panama straw because of the uh, building of the Panama Canal uh -huh, at the time. Interesting. But, yeah, these so are, these are like the original felt that you started with. Right, these are like the felt them. cartwheels, oh, although okay. they do come in hood shapes as well. These are for slightly different kinds of hats. Okay. Um, here's some printed, this is probably what they would oh, call So some giraffe. of the smaller hats you would right, use this? Right, I would use this, oh, like the one here under your hat oh. there that you're <laughs> well, I'm gonna put going on. to try on. <laughs> And that's a lovely look? aubergine cloche in the velour felt, very similar to the, some of these shapes here on the table. And then I've trimmed it with felt leaves and then a silk and velvet flower on the side there. Well, I think it suits me. It does, and it goes with the purple in your shirt, <laughs> yes. that, or excuse me, your sweater. Um, so these are a variety of, of sh colors. Um, that the felt comes in. The straws come in all colors, too. And then if it isn't coming in the color that I need, I can dye it. And then you have trim to show us as well. I do. Let's take a look at that 
really quickly. So I use all kinds of flowers. I make all kinds of leaf shapes. Oh, this look is at a that. wired acanthus leaf. Oh, it has the wire in the middle. Right. Oh. This is a straw leaf that I've made the base of it from this and edged it in this. Aha. Uh -huh. And so it's a bold leaf, of course. Wow. This is another type of feather. This is a little cockade from things. the felt. This is a little chrysanthemum or a carnation from the straw braid as well. So you, you go shopping, you buy things, you make things, <laughs> all for your trim. They're beautiful. I do. Absolutely gorgeous. So tell us what your future plans are. Where can people find your hats? My studio, as we talked about earlier, is at the Pen Peninsula Museum of Art in Burlingame. And I teach classes there. I make hats for people. I, um, I do some wholesale. I do retail there. Um, that's where it's at. Are there any shows coming up? Ah, open studios for the entire complex is the weekend of November 7th and 8th. Oh, so all the variety of artists that are there. They'll all be there. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, it's a beautiful place, and they have a large gallery space as well yes, there, too. Yes, there's three um, exhibition rooms, and then there's 30 studios to visit. Wow, tell us a little bit about your teaching. How can people learn to become milliners? <laughs> well, in general, I teach once a month, typically a three-day workshop. And at least in the beginning workshop, you work on a variety of the different materials. and then. Most of people's experience with hats has to come with repetition and getting that into your system. So then I do have lab classes or specialty classes oh. for the ribbon, for the trim, all different kinds of things. Well, thank you so much for being on Talk Art. This has been a fascinating tour into beautiful hats. Thank you, Sally.